Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Deep Multiomic Phenotyping of Biospecimens for Immuno-Oncology Applications. I am Michelle Ashton of Labroof, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Labroof and brought to you by Meltony Biotech. To learn more, visit www.miltonybiotech.com. Let's get started. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want and any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, Click on the support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the ask a question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I now present today's speaker. Dr. Sean Fall, the Director of Flow Cytometry Services at Discovery Life Sciences. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Fall, you may now begin your presentation. Welcome. Thank you, Michelle, and, and thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, today I'm going to talk about our multi-analytical platforms for uh, phenotyping and characterizing our human biospecimens for downstream IO applications. For those of you unfamiliar with Discovery Life Sciences, uh, Discovery Life Sciences is built on four key competencies. Um, the first and the base of these key competencies is biospecimens, both the acquisition preparation and preservation of these samples. Um, these samples come in multiple different formats, including fixed samples such as FFPE, uh, viable samples such as PBMCs, uh, bone marrow mononuclear cells, and associated tumor cells, which we'll talk about a little bit later in the presentation. Um, we do have full EMR access into all of our clinical sites, um, so these samples come with a high degree of annotation. We also have a normal donor clinic. Um, through this normal donor clinic, we have access uh, to biofluids from normal donors, including apheresis products, um, which is something else we'll discuss today. Off of this base of biospecimens, we have three analytical pipelines um, for which we can help to annotate these downstream um, specimens. The first is genomics. Um, in this case, we offer a full suite of whole genome, whole exome, and RNA-seq technologies. Um, these also include targeted sequencing as well as long-range sequencing platforms. Additionally, we have um, IHC capabilities. This is both in terms of the validation and testing of clinical samples at scale on, again, multiple different platforms, as well as in-house pathologists um, to, to analyze and interpret that data. Finally, um, we have a cell services platform. This platform deals with all assays in which have viable cells and starting materials. So this is primarily flow cytometry, although we do also offer cell culture, cell isolations, as well as 10x genomics technologies downstream of these products. For today's webinar, um, we're going to focus on three main learning points. The first point is how we phenotype our apheresis donors and how we use this information for both determining uh, potential donors for downstream cell therapy manufacturing, as well as for different cell isolations. Um, the last two learning points will focus on our dissociated tumor cell offering. Um, the second one will focus on how we use flow cytometry to characterize these samples, as well as use them for identifying samples for different downstream platforms. And then finally, the third learning point will focus on our use of single cell genomic technologies, uh, to use for identifying novel biomarkers, um, again, in dissociated tumor cells. Our apheresis clinic is located directly adjacent to our production facility, which allows seamless transition from the apheresis donor to downstream um, manufacturing. We currently have five chairs in operation, although by the end of the year that will be up to eight chairs. We're currently using the Spectra Optia as our apheresis machine with ACDA as our anticoagulant. All of our donors are HLA-typed by next-gen sequencing for six-digit high resolution, 
And all of our donors go through viral screening for Hep B, Hep C, and HIV, as well as CMV and EBV reactivity. Our cell viability is consistently about 95% or greater um, directly after collection. We do use a dunucleation dye cell counter, in this case the Nexalon Salometer for cell counting, and we are ISO 9001 certified. We do offer this apheresis material in several formats, um, both fresh and frozen leukopacks um, in either a full, half, or quarter size. We then further isolate these leukopacks down to mononuclear cells, again, offered in multiple sizes or any of the major immune cell populations present in peripheral blood. Uh, additionally, we do do culture um, to generate both macrophages and dendritic cells from monocytes harvested from our apheresis donors. And we will soon be releasing GMB compliant leukopacks. Um, for more information on that offering, please feel free to contact us at info.info@dls.com. So our apheresis donors are fully typed at the HLA loci. Um, this slide just gives you an indication of the number of unique alleles we see at each locus um, to show that we do have a breadth of many, many different alleles that are available. Um, we more commonly ask for HLA 02, 03, and A24. Um, we do have over 100 donors in each of those uh, HLA types. Um, and these can be offered, usually we have donors that are uh, AO2 and then AO3 or another allele, although we do have some donors represent um, both AO2 on both alleles. Additionally, we did validate an in-house flow cytometry assay to also look at AO2 reactive donors or AO2 positive donors. Um, this assay allows us to um, evaluate donors real time um, and gives us a binary yes-no as to if these donors are AO2 positive or negative, and those are the flow plots shown in the bottom right. Um, additionally, the donors are classified for reactivity against CMV and EBV. Um, this is done by ELISA. Um, consistent with, with other reports, about half of our donor population is reactive to CMV, while um, the majority are reactive to EBV. Um, this data becomes very useful with the HLA data because we can now classify donors and look for antigen-specific T cells, which is displayed in the right panels here. These are looking at donors that were classified as CMV reactive or non-reactive by serology ELISA. Um, then using dextromers against a specific peptide from CMV, we can identify CD8 T cells from HLA-AO2 positive donors um, that were previously classified as, as CMV reactive or non-reactive. So this allows us to use this data uh, to further hone in on donors that would be suitable for uh, downstream assays um, that we're trying to run. The real power of, of what we're doing with our apheresis clinic, though, is our immunophenotyping of all our donors that come through the clinic. So, and, and this schematic shows how that workflow um, is performed. In this case, the donor leukopack is um, brought into the lab and isolated down into the mononuclear cell fraction. Um, at this point, we use Miltani, Milteni's MaxQuant 16 flow cytometer. Um, we have um, a, analysis templates that we've set up that the technicians can seamlessly stain the cells and stain for either lymphocyte or monocyte populations um, within each donor. And that for, therefore, they'll have the ability to know which donors would be good either for shipping fresh or frozen leukopacks that are required to have a specific percentage of each cell population or for downstream isolation um, and eventual choir pres preservation in-house. So looking at our donor population um, as box box and whisker plots here. Um, you can see there is a lot of variability within the donor pool um, for each cell type that we're currently profiling. Um, what we've done is use this data to basically set thresholds. Um, and these thresholds, um, which are displayed in these orange boxes, allow us to define which donors would or would not be good for downstream isolations. And so this allows us to get the most efficiency out of a leukopack. Um, it ensures the highest purity of the cells downstream, such that if we do a T cell donor who falls below 50%, we're fairly confident that our, our efficiency and our purity will be very low. And we try to avoid having any inefficiencies with these packs um, just to make them um, the most out of all this material that we do receive into the lab. Um, in addition to aminophenotyping these donors, we also perform functional assays in-house. Um, an example for, of that is a, a large T cell expansion project that we recently completed. Um, in this case, the apheresis donors were brought in and the entire leukopack was isolated down to CD3 T cells. Um, at this point, a proportion of the pack 
was frozen down as, as primary non-expanded cells. Um, a very small proportion of that total population was then expanded using the Milpenny Transact system um, over about 14 to 20 days. Um, this gives us an expanded T-cell population um, to provide, which best represents um, an expanded population used for CAR T-cell therapies. Um, additionally, during this expansion process, we evaluated not only the cell counts and the rough cell size during the expansion, but also um, the expression of known regulators of T-cell function or that are kinetically different throughout the expansion process. And in this case, that's CD25, CD69, and, and PD1 were the key markers we were looking at. Um, using this, we can follow the T-cell activation throughout the entire study. Uh, this allows us to know when was the best time to remove the stimulus um, to allow the cells rest prior to preservation. Um, it also gives the platform for additional um, target molecules to be analyzed throughout this entire uh, time course. So in, in this way, we really use the, the MaxPlot platform not only to phenotype the initial patient samples to identify which donors are best for which projects, but then also for downstream um, expansion and functionality tests. For the remainder of the talk, I'm going to focus on our dissociated tumor cell offering. And first, we're going to talk about how we've really hyper-annotated these uh, dissociated tumor cells at, at a very large scale. Um, so, dissociated tumor cells are single cell suspensions of solid tumor indications. We have also performed dissociations of normal tissue, some autoimmune tissue, and some metastatic tissue. Most of that metastatic tissue is melanoma lymph nodes. Um, this is generated via proprietary mechanical and genetic digestion. Um, these cells are then cryopreserved, and this really allows us to have full annotation of the sample prior to using it for any study. Um, while the pathologists are very, very good at identifying what the tumor is upon resection, um, every once in a while we do find an instance where upon review a colorectal cancer actually turned out to be some sort of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, and so that obviously is problematic if colorectal cancer is what you're looking for. So we let these cells cryopreserve. Um, the cryopreserve is very good in terms of maintaining viability um, after the thaw it's still 70% or greater. Um, and then that allows for the best annotation and selection of samples for downstream platforms. So what we do for all of these associated tissues is after they go through the freeze-thaw cycle, um, upon thaw they go through a flow cytometry analysis to classify all of the cellular subsets in the tumor as well as HLAO2 status by flow. Um, again, a binary is the donor HLAO2 positive or negative. Um, the the panel that we're currently running is 12 markers large. Um, we first pregate out all dead cells, and that's one thing that we found to be incredibly crucial with these associated tissues, is that the use of a live dead discriminator, be that a, um, a DNA dye such as DAP or PI or any of the amine reactive fixable live dead discriminators, is really crucial as these uh, associated tissues have a fair amount of debris um, that can complicate downstream flow analysis. We also recommend the use of a marker against red cells. We do use CD235A or GLI-A um, in this manner. Um, for fresh associations, there are a lot of red cells present, and these do remain after cryopreservation. Um, the initial flow plots that we look at um, are plots of CD45 versus FCAM. Um, this allows us to identify CD45 positive immune cells, um, which you can see in the bottom right corner of the flow plot, versus um, FCAM positive tumor cells in the top left. Uh, we do use FCAM for all of our tumors um, with a couple exceptions. Um, melanoma does not express FCAM. We validated a couple different markers and found CD146 um, to be the best marker for identifying melanoma tumor cells. So for melanoma, we do use CD146. Um, for glioblastoma and hepatocellular carcinoma, um, we have yet, have yet not identified a marker that reliably works for us. Um, so when I show some data later, um, just keep in mind that those two subsets are going to underrepresent um, the tumor cell fraction just because we don't have a great marker for identifying that. Um, following this um, gating strategy, we further classify all of the immune cell populations um, by the major lymphoid and myeloid populations that would be present within the tumor. Um, this includes the CD4 and CD8 T cells as well as the B cell populations. Uh, we do look at NK cells. They tend to be the rarest of all the cell types that we are analyzing, so we will gate on CD3 negative cells prior to analyzing those. 
Um, and then we do look at myeloid cells, both as CD11B positive and then um, the monocytic or granulocytic cells by the expression of CD14 or CD15, respectively. Um, at this point, we have analyzed over 2,500 uh, unique primary tumor samples. Um, this is a heat map showing the average of each of the cell types that we do characterize across um, about almost 20 different indications. Um, and we're going to go through this heat map a little bit more closely over the next couple slides. Um, this does not include any of our normal tissue, our autoimmune tissue, or our metastatic melanoma. Um, so if we first look um, at the tumor or immune cell populations, um, you can see that there are two types of, of tumor cell or tumor populations that exist, those that are highly immune infiltrated and those that are not. Um, we find that lung um, and renal tend to be very highly immune infiltrated when we have um, analyzed them versus something like breast, uh, colorectal, ovarian, um, which have more of a tumor representation when we've analyzed them by flow. Uh, C4 and CD8 T cells uh, tend to be uh, very standard, and actually the averages come out to be pretty equivalent across all the tumor types, um, except for uh, prostate cancer, which interestingly enough has a, a high percentage of CD8 T cells within the immune cell fraction. Um, this was, was a little surprising to us. However, uh, we went through the literature. There was studies that have confirmed both by flow and by IHC um, a high proportion of CD8 T cells within prostate cancer. Um, as I mentioned previously, NK cells are very, very rare. Um, when we do see them, it primarily is within kidney, ovarian, or, or liver cancer. Um, B cells tend to be restricted mostly to gastric colorectal cancer, um, although there are some unique patients within other indications that have high percentages of NK cells and B cells. Finally, for the, the myeloid compartment, um, mostly myeloid cells are present within brain cancer and ovarian cancer. Um, brain, this, this makes some sense with the high component of myeloid cells that's normally present um, within the brain tissue. Um, again, this does vary on a patient-by-patient -patient, um, level. Granulocytes um, are by far the rarest of the myeloid subtypes, um, and these happen to also be the only subtype that we found to be sensitive to the freeze thaw. Um, as I mentioned, these are averages. So if you look at something like lung cancer here, which upon first look at this heat map would seem to be all immune cells with very little tumor present, um, this really is an average. So if we look at all of those uh, lung DTCs that we've currently analyzed, you do see that we do see a spread. So while most of the samples are, are highly immune infiltrated, we do have some samples that do have a high tumor percentage. And then as far as each of the immune percentages are concerned, there are some that are high for T-cell uh, infiltration or myeloid infiltration. Um, and so it really is heterogeneous among the population. So we use this data mostly to help with sample selection for studies that are focused more on T-cells or B-cells or monocytes. Um, but within an indication, you will have a high degree of variability. After the initial characterization of the DTCs at the cellular subset, we really became interested in looking at what markers specifically T cells express. And this was really driven by the um, great successes with checkpoint inhibitor therapies like Keytruda and Opdivo. So there are a number of molecules on the surface of T cells that will regulate their activity both in a positive and negative format. So we first focused on um, addressing whether or not we could identify PD-L1 and PD-1 expression within DTCs um, to use these to further classify these samples for downstream analysis. Uh, to do this, we used the um, companion diagnostic for Keytruda Opdiva, which is PD-L1 expression by IHC. So in this case, we're looking at uh, two lung cancer and one kidney cancer patient sample that were stained with PD-L1 um, by HC and identified a sample that was classified by our pathologist to be 100% PD-L1 expressing, have no expression of PD-L1, or in the case of the renal, um, somewhere in between. We then looked at matched DTCs. So these are samples that were generated from the same patients as these FFPE blocks. And when we looked at the tumor cell fractions within these uh, dissociated tumor cells, we found a very high degree of correlation with the uh, FFP IHC data in that we saw almost complete expression of PD-L1 on the tumor cells for the sample that had 100%, no expression on the sample that had 0%, and a shoulder of expression on the renal sample that when gated on was roughly 20 to 30%. And over all the samples we've done, we see a high degree of correlation between the percentage of PD-L1 positive cells by IHC 
compared to the percentage of pd one positive cells by flow. Um, the nice thing about flow and the advantage of flow is that um, it has multiple markers. So we can now get a little more granular as to what other cell types within the tumor microenvironment might express uh, PD-L1. Um, in this case, we looked at the myeloid compartment as defined by CD11B expression or T cells by CD3 expression and found that there was um, evidence of PD-L1 expression in both of these subsets, although it was very low on T cells. Um, at this point, we've done about 60 samples across the six indications that currently receive checkpoint inhibitor therapy in the clinic. Um, and we found that pretty much for every indication, there are some patients that will display uh, PDL1 positivity on the tumor cell fraction. Um, across the board, there was some evidence of PDL1 expression on CD11B cells in all cases, except interestingly enough for renal. Um, and that wasn't due to a loss or a, a deficiency of myeloid cells in that indication as that traditionally does have a lot of myeloid cells and we've analyzed it. Um, and finally, CD3 cells had very low expression or very few cells expressing PD-L1, um, but they were present in all the indications we looked at. Conversely, if we looked at the PD-1 receptor, on um, this case on the immune cell subsets, we saw that most of the CD4 and CD8 T cells within the tumor seem to have high expression of PD-1. Again, this was across the board in all of the six indications that we looked at. Um, it was usually greater than 50% um, or higher. We did look at the other immune cell subsets within the tumor, including B cells and NK cells. For the most part, these cell types were mostly deficient for pd one expression, or PD-1 expression, excuse me, although there were some um, indications, particularly colorectal cancer, where there was evidence of PD-1 expression on B cells and NK cells, and, and again, this was um, confirmed by several studies that have been published within the academic literature. So while PD-1 and PD-L1 served as a, as a great case study um, and a known receptor ligand pair um, within the tumor microenvironment, we wanted to take a little more unbiased look at some of the other receptor ligand pairs um, that could be present within the tumor. So to um, do this, we generated a 14-color flow cytometry panel for evaluating these receptor ligand pairs. Uh, so again, this panel first gates out any dead cells by DAPI um, and any red cells using GLI-A. We then use the same FCAM by CD45 um, plot to identify tumor and all immune cells. This time when we gate on the immune cells, however, we first gate um, on the myeloid cells as CD11B positive versus the T cells as CD3 positive. CD3 positive T cells are further defined by CD4 or CD8 into the CD4 or CD8 compartments. The myeloid cells are then characterized by CD14 and HLA-DR, um, such that the CD14 positive cells will be most of those monocytic cells that are present within the tumor. The CD14 negative cells are generally always those, cell, those granulocytic cells that also express CD15. Um, HLA-DR was added so that we could identify potential uh, myeloid-derived suppressor cells that might be present within the tumor. And then finally, the cd b negative CD3 negative subset was uh, stained for CD19 to identify B cells. Um, this provides a nice internal negative control as most of these uh, T cell receptors are not expressed on the B cell subset. So it provides us a nice control um, when we're looking at expression levels. By doing this panel, we have three channels left open. Um, we used PE, APC, and the PE size 7 channels as they have the best signals. And that allows us to little, look a little more in depth at new or potentially novel um, co-stimulatory and co-inhibitory molecules that might be expressed within the tumor. So um, again, there are a lot of molecules that can modulate T cell receptor function. Um, to do this by flow would obviously take quite a lot of time and quite a lot of optimization. So to help us um, further um, define what cells or what um, receptors we'd like to look at, we performed bulk RNA-seq um, on eight different DTC samples across four different indications. So this heat map shows the expression levels of all those co-stimulatory, co-inhibitory ligands um, and receptors within these eight tumors. The uh, bottom four genes are a T cell signature, um, which is used to define cold tumors, which are displayed on the left, versus hot tumors, which are displayed on the right. So if we look first at PD-1, PD-L1, PD-L2, um, we see at the RNA level these are all expressed, um, which is, um, confirms our flow cytometry data. Um, interestingly, PD-L2 um, is very lowly expressed, although we did um, define some expression levels, um, which was pretty unique. 
We did look at some of the uh, co-stimulatory molecules in general. We found the receptors to be expressed, but not the ligands. Um, we did confirm this by flow as well. Um, I'm not going to go through that data today. Instead, I'm going to focus today on the other co-inhibitory molecules that were expressed within the tumor. Um, we saw that there was expression of LAG3, TIGIT, VISTA, and TIM3. Um, and in contrast to the co-stimulatory molecules, the ligands for these co-inhibitory molecules we did find to be expressed and usually at fairly high levels um, at the RNA level. So an example of what this data now looks like is we can actually analyze uh, these receptor ligand pairs by flow. Um, we're showing the data here as a TISNI plot so that we can remove the bias of predating any cell type and looking at its expression pattern. So in this case, we're looking at a lung cancer sample that is very immune infiltrated. The tumor cells are, are represented in the mauve or brownish color um, in the top um, versus the uh, immune cell subsets, which are primarily the T cells, CD4 and CD8, um, a large B cell compartment as well as a myeloid compartment. Now, when we look at TIGIT expression, um, we see that the TIGIT expression is primarily restricted to the T cell compartment, although there is a small subset of cells in the middle that does stay positive for TIGIT based on other studies we believe these to be NK cells. Um, conversely, the ligand for TIGIT, uh, PVRL2, is restricted almost exclusively to the tumor cells, the myeloid compartment, as well as a compartment of cells that we have largely believed to be fibroblasts and NCL cells. We did look for PVR expression. We found it to be more lowly expressed than PVRL2 and to be highly patient dependent. Some patients did express PVR, others did not. Um, so we focused mostly on PVRL2 when we did these studies. Now, all of these studies have focused on primarily using the entire tumor um, for flow cytometry analysis, but these single cell suspensions do um, work very well for any sort of downstream magnetic isolation. We've done both T cells uh, and tumor cells. Um, I'm going to go through the tumor cell data briefly. So we have used Milteni's tumor cell enrichment kit. Um, the beauty of this kit is that it doesn't predispose any expression of any molecule on the tumor. Instead, it binds to everything that should not be tumor within the tumor microenvironment, including red cells, immune cells, fibroblasts, and endothelial cells. And basically, everything that's not selected would therefore be tumor cells. So in this case, this is showing an example from an ovarian cancer cell sample. Um, again, see, looking at CD45 by EPCAM expression, um, you can see that there's about a 40% representation of both populations. After we put it through um, this negative selection process, it's greater than 95% EPCAM positive, which is, again, the marker that we've been using to bind tumor cells although we don't have, it doesn't preclude um, samples that don't express FCAM from going through this process, and we have done this with melanoma, and it does work quite well. Um, at this point, we've, we've performed this tumor cell isolations on over 100 unique samples on almost 10 different indications. Um, in all cases, we do achieve greater than 90% uh, uh, FCAM positive cells following the enrichment with a very high viability. Um, and this goes down into something um, like lung, which is notoriously very immune infiltrated, we still can get greater than 95% viability on these tumor cell enrichments. So this provides us a way to do any sort of magnetic pre-enrichment prior to going into more downstream flow, um, any sort of cell culture or downstream genomics studies. The final um, point that we want to talk about today is single cell genomic characterization of dissociated tissues. Um, so recently, we brought in the 10x Genomics platform um, and have been using that to characterize dissociated tissues um, at the RNA level. So this workflow is very similar to our flow workflow for characterizing DTCs. The difference here is that we do this on both fresh and frozen samples, and all of our samples go through a key QC check prior to being loaded into the 10x Chromium platform. Um, given the expense and the highly technical nature of single cell technologies, we want to make sure that all samples are of the best quality and best represent the needs of the downstream projects. So these inclusion exclusion criteria can include um, different tumor percentages that are required for the study, different CD4, CD8 T cell ratios. And so everything goes through a QC check on the MaxQuant platform prior to being selected into the study. Um, if it is selected into the study, um, it'll either be directly loaded into the 10x box or go through either a magnetic or some sort of text-based cell sorting um, prior to loading for different subsets. 
an example of some of the projects that we have currently running or have completed using um, associated tissues includes a large-scale study on mutation characterized colorectal cancer samples. Um, these were characterized for KRAS, NRAS, BRAF mutations, as well as MSI status. Um, all of these samples were purified and the entire tumor microenvironment was loaded and analyzed by single cell RNA-seq. Additionally, we have been focusing on head and neck cancer samples, specifically from the oral cavity, and performing both single cell RNA-seq as well as TCR and BCR repertoire analysis. We've also been sorting CD3 positive T cells from multiple indications, mostly lung, renal, and colorectal. These T cells have been um, further profiled for single cell T cell receptor as well as CyteSeq. And finally, we've been subdividing CD8 T cells, specifically from renal cell samples, to perform single cell RNA seq and T cell receptor analysis. Um, so, I'm going to go through some data generated from the colorectal cancer samples, um, as well as some of the T cell receptor sample data, um, as an example of, of what this data looks like. So again, using TISNY plots, this is an example of a single colorectal cancer DTC sample. In this case, we annotated each population based on the expression of transcripts for each cell type. Um, so the top populations are T cell populations, either CD4 or CD8. As this is um, RNA, we were able to identify the Treg population by FOXP3 expression. We were further able to identify two B cell populations. Um, these were identified by the expression of CD79A, um, but interestingly, one of them did have markers consistent with plasma cells. So we identified both a plasma cell and non-plasma cell B cell fraction. The tumor cells are represented by the brown fraction in the middle, and then the myeloid cells are the smaller fraction represented by the pink. Now, while these TISNY plots give you the nice uh, cell subsets within the tumor, because this is single cell RNA data, we now have roughly a thousand different transcripts that we can look at and see where those transcripts fall within each of these annotated populations. So one example is a lytic enzyme, such as granzyme B. Um, as expected, this is primarily um, restricted to the CD8 compartment. Um, we've looked at all the other granzymes as well as perforin, and again, these are restricted almost entirely to the CD8 T cells. Nice proof of concept that these single cell RNA seq data set is performing as we would expect. So, if we again look at those uh, co stimulatory co inhibitory molecules, particularly PD1 and the TIGIT family members, um, we can see that this does correlate great with the flow cytometry data that we previously generated. So, PD1 is primarily expressed by the T cell compartment, um, CD8 T cells as well as the T regs, although the CD4 T cells in this specific CD, uh, CC. CRC sample have less expression of PD-1. Um, it is not expressed by the B cells, the myeloid cells, or the tumor cell fraction. So conversely, when we look at PD-L1 expression um, within this colorectal cancer tumor, we can see that it's largely restricted to the myeloid compartment, and interestingly enough, the T regulatory compartments. Um, however, in this case, this, this CRC tumor is negative on the tumor cells for PD-L1 expression. Now, we've looked for PDL2 expression by flow. It's been hard to detect, but by the RNA level, we can see that it is expressed. Um, it's not expressed as, as many cells as PDL1, um, but it is expressed by a few uh, T regulatory cells as, one of, as well as some of the myeloid cells within this tumor. TIGIT, on the other hand, is expressed much more highly and much more broadly than PD1 is in, in this specific colorectal cancer sample and it's expressed pretty much across the entire T cell compartment. Again, it's restricted to that compartment, doesn't seem to uh, be expressed by any of the other immune or tumor cell subsets. In this case, we can ex define expression of PVR. Um, again, it's not to nearly the extent of PVR L2, but it is expressed by a few of the tumor cells as well as some of the myeloid cells. But the main ligand expressed for TIGIT is PVRL2, again, restricted almost to the entirely to the myeloid compartment as well as to part of the uh, tumor compartment. So this data set really allows you to look at all of the co-stimulatory, co-inhibitory molecules rather than being restricted to just a few. Um, these technology then can be used to either do barcoded antibodies in CyteSeq or back to flow cytometry to have orthogonal assays to really evaluate this at the protein level. 
Finally, um, looking at single cell TCR repertoire data, uh, looking at CD, sorted CDA T cells from a renal tumor, uh, we do see a high degree of clonality. Uh, we've seen this actually in all of the CDA T cells that we've sorted, um, such that um, oftentimes it's 10% or greater of the CDA T cells have a single clonotype. Um, this is really interesting and, and really great for those um, folks who are interested in T cell repertoire analysis of T cell therapies as it allows for the identification of potentially immune reactive or tumor reactive T cells. So throughout this talk, um, I hope we've been able to uh, discuss how we use um, the Penny platforms to phenotype our donors um, from our apheresis, cl apheresis clinic for downstream isolations and potential use in cell therapy manufacturing how we use, um, again, the, the Milpenny platform to characterize our DTCs um, at a high degree uh, for both the use of sample selection as well as for identification of, of new and novel targets. And then finally, how these DTCs can be used um, in single cell RNA-seq and, and other single cell technologies uh, to, again, identify novel biomarkers. And with that, I'll take any questions, um, and we can always be reached at either our website, uh, dls.com, or through contacting us at info at dls.com. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fall, for your informative presentation. We'll now start the Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Our first question is, how long does it take to get a donor collected and Leukopack shipped once we submit a request? So for donors where there's no inclusion exclusion criteria, it's usually about 10 to 15 business days. Um, we're generally scheduled about two weeks in advance um, for any collection. If there is inclusion exclusion criteria, it can take a little bit longer for us to identify the correct donor, um, but generally the two to three week turnaround is what we're currently looking at. Great, thank you. Okay, let's see, do you see rare cell types in your Leukopax? We do, so we, we have identified the dendritic cell subsets. Um, primarily we focused on plasmacytoid dendritic cells, although the myeloid dendritic cells are also present. Uh, we do also see CD34 positive stem cells in these leukopaks. packs. They tend to vary um, more than the uh, more popular or more um, abundant T cell, B cell subsets, um, but they are present within in the leukopaks. How do you evaluate new or unknown targets of interest? That is a great question. Uh, that's probably the question that we get the most uh, when we talk about dissociated tumor cells. So any new or unknown targets, um, since our process is mechanical and enzymatic, what we do is we'll do a mock dissociation either on PBMCs or a cell line where we know that the marker is expressed. Uh, those cells then go through the dissociation and are compared against undissociated cells to see if there's any sensitivity um, to the receptor or to the um, enzymatic mixture. If there is, we do have the option to change the dissociation protocol. It tends to negatively impact viability, but it does overall retain expression of all of the receptors that we've looked at so far. Thank you, Dr. Fall. We have time for a couple more questions here. Your next question, have you, attempt, have you ever attempted to culture DTCs? We have. So we've had good success culturing DTCs both in short term and long term. Uh, for short term, they work very well for spheroid cultures. Uh, we do highly recommend using the ultra low attachment plates. Uh, the more traditional tissue culture coated plates, um, the cells will try to attach a lot of times that causes cell death pretty quickly. Um, we also know that these um, DTCs are amenable to the long term organoid cultures and the semi solid matrix. Um, they do take a while to propagate. Um, but they do work quite well for that, that technology. All right, let's go ahead and wrap up with this last question. Have you tried ATAC-seq and what would the workflow look like? So we are about to uh, undertake our first ATAC-seq project. So the, the workflow for those projects is a little different um, as it does need nuclear isolation prior to going into ATAC-seq. Uh, what we do in that case is we oftentimes do a pre-pilot 
where we'll actually figure out the exact right conditions for either the frozen tissue or the cell type to get uh, accurate and efficient nuclei isolation. Once we figure that out, then we'll move actually on to the ATAC-seq part of the project. Uh, and that way we don't have to waste um, valuable material um, optimizing and, and going directly into sequencing when it's not needed. Thank you again, Dr. Fall, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Milkenny Biotech, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their questions. Any questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's event. Until next time, goodbye.